Welcome everyone to a new episode of Duck Chatter. This is episode number five, and I'm very happy today to introduce uh, Frederick Hiskins from uh, the University of Melbourne. Uh, Fred is a PhD student, mainly working on, uh, on theory. Um, yeah, so thank you for your time, Fred. Thank you very much, Giovanni. So uh, before we start, maybe we can briefly talk about uh, when and how you started your PhD and what are your uh, general interests and uh, or maybe the, if you want to talk about the direction of uh, your PhD project. Sure, absolutely. So um, I'm a year into my PhD now. Um, kind of the direction I've gone in was pretty much uh, set and set by uh, my master's project. So I don't know if you can relate to this at all, but I've tracked my master's project, the idea of it, down to one line in one of my supervisor's papers, where he basically says, ah, it'd be interesting to do this. And then I'm the person who gets to do the interesting thing, which is, um, which at that stage was looking at um, the effects which axion-like particles can have inside uh, stars. And so uh, we kind of got into this because this is this, there had been like a gradual development of stellar, uh, stellar cooling constraints on Alps for a while. Um, starting with kind of the Raffeltian Gale graph up that is um, kind of like his analytic ones where you would have a, an equation and then integrate it over a solar model or, so, or uh, specific types of stars. But then the more recent trend was to uh, actually take the specific energy loss uh, forms of the energy loss and then embed it in stellar evolution code. And so this originally started with just kind of, you know, QCD axions or axions whose like masses, are, or Alps rather, whose masses are light compared to the temperature scale of the star. But then my work was kind of coming in saying, oh, okay, what happens when you actually, in this nice little region of parameter space, kind of the KEV to MEV range where the production of these Alps starts to become Boltzmann suppressed. And that hadn't been done at the time. Uh, and now a couple of authors have, have done a few things on it. So that was kind of where I came in. But pretty late in my project, um, I kind of found that actually, you know, I've been doing all this stuff with, you know, healing and burning stars, which is where you tend to see the sort of most stringent uh, stellar constraints. But actually, in this nice little uh, region in the KV to MEV masses, actually looking at later stellar evolution uh, phases of stellar stellar evolution um, could produce some pretty significant re results. And you know, there were much those stars were just much more sensitive to those heavier Alps. And so, the start of my PhD, the job was okay. Well, I've ident identified how promising this could be, but how do I actually turn that into a constraint? Um, and so, yeah, that was the original goal. Beyond that though, so like the obvious theme there is uh, from a particle physics perspective is axion-like particles. You know, it'd be nice to look at some other, uh, throughout my PhD, look at some other astrophysical constraints and also cosmological constraints on those. But um, I wouldn't limit myself to Alps, just generally interested in, wis uh, in WISPs. Um, so hidden photons as well could be so cool. Uh, something that I'd, I'd really like to look at in some more detail um, and just you know just generally generally increasing my theoretical understanding of these things because <laughs> the, 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 the kind of the nature with these things is I got I handled the particle physics side at it very early but the rest of it was running stellar evolution simulations which is not exactly um, what, what most particle physicists would do so can't neglect that side of things either that's that's right me. yeah so uh, like the idea is that today we want to talk about uh, your new paper that was uh, would appear on the archive just mm -hmm. very recently, uh, a few months ago. So, uh, and, and that's, as, as you pointed out, is, uh, is about putting a constraint on axon-like particles. Uh, and looking at the title is using white, white dwarf uh, initial final mass uh, relation. Mm -hmm. So uh, you talked about the motivation on your work, uh, axon-like particle in general. Uh, so before going into the details, can you can you like uh, explain why axon-like particles? I mean, I'm assuming that the, the general audience is, is familiar with the QCD axon and what an axon-like particle mm -hmm. is, but why did uh, like axon-like particle uh, get so much attention in, in the community lately? Well, I mean, there are a few reasons. One of them is obviously uh, they're a candidate, they're a dark matter candidate, so there's always going to be a bit of attention around there. But also, more recently, um, the uh, excess seen in the electron in electron recoil at Xenon one ton has, you know, driven driven interest up quite a lot, and so and particularly in the context of stellar cooling constraints as well. Um, in fairness to my work, I, I'm not I'm not pretending to change the landscape on that yet. So uh, I'm working in a kind of a 
a slightly different region, but it is something to be to be aware of and a, a reason why people might like to to see this because this isn't this work isn't probably I would say yet the completed picture of how this stuff could be used in the context of um, stellar cooling constraints, but it's a nice step and I'd I'd like to see it developed further and maybe influence those things one day. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So usually when talking about action like particles, we we see the, those plots uh, or the parameter space between coupling mm -hmm. and mass. Uh, and we can uh, put some constraints with experiments, cosmology and astrophysics. So focusing on, on your work, we're looking at the astrophysical side. Uh, can you review a little bit the main concept behind uh, the stellar cooling and how can we in general put a constraint on, on axon-like particles? Sure, sure. And so the, the idea of this comes back to the fact that in the original axion models, like the, the original scale that was proposed for um, yeah, the, for the decay length was kind of the weak scale and it's pretty quickly ruled out by experiment because uh, these things would have been detected and they, and they just weren't. And so the idea then became, well, if you can make that scale very large, you have um, the coupling is, is suppressed and you have these so-called invisible axion models. And the invisible axions, well, in that case, instead of looking at you know, a collider system, you, you, could, you could look at a, at a very high luminosity system or something like that. So a great example of this is stars where you just have, it's a very big system, um, kind of, you know, KEV, MEV, energy, uh, yeah, energies. And the idea is if these particles exist, even though they have such small coupling strengths, they could be copiously produced uh, in those environments. And so um, if these things are produced because they're weakly interacting, instead of just, instead of, um, well, they would just freely escape the star. So they'd be produced, not interact with anything and just zoom off out, out, of, the sky, out of the star. And so that constitutes a new source of energy loss. Um, turns out uh, astrophysicists knew pretty well what happens when uh, you just, when you take energy out of a stellar region. Um, and so that depends on, uh, on, one th on a few things. First of all, uh, if that region is, isn't undergoing any kind of nuclear fusion or there's no burning going on there, then it's just going to cool down. It loses energy, it cools. But pretty interestingly, if it, if it is um, undergoing nuclear fusion, instead of just cooling down, it actually contracts. Um, it contracts and it heats. And this increase in temperature really drives up the energy loss rates. Um, first of all, the energy loss rates. So you get more, stellar, more energy loss to the Alps, but then also uh, also really increases the, the rate of nuclear burning. And so the main result of this, if you increase the rate of nuclear burning is that you churn through the, new, the available supply of nuclear fuel much faster. And so the main phenomenological effect of this kind of energy loss on stars is to decrease the evolutionary timescales of, of, of burning. And so this was originally looked at in the context of the sun, so this is just the star we know the most about. So um, the solar age came into that and then also um, metal content and other things. So um, a whole bunch of, you, you, could, you could look at it a few ways to see how Alps would, or axions at the time, would, would change our understanding of the current solar model. And that generated one constraint, but then people pretty quickly found, again, Georg Raphael at the forefront of this, he did a lot in this area and still does, um, that if you look at later, a later evolutionary phase, so helium burning, uh, these are called horizontal branch stars. They're low mass, you know, less than a couple of solar masses stars, which are undergoing helium burning. Then these ones, they give you very, very strong constraints. Um, and so the way these things are constrained is that um, uh, you can look, you can look at globular clusters. So these, these are like large gravitationally bound collections of stars, um, which you can resolve with telescopes. And basically, just count count the number of stars you can resolve, and you can you can tell um, you can you can compare the you can work out what the ratio of horizontal branch stars, so those ones which are burning helium in their cores, to red giant branch stars, so those stars which are before which haven't at least yet uh, started burning helium in their cores. Um, and the key thing here is that well, the duration of helium burning is decreased when you add if axions were present or if Alps were present. Um, but the duration of the red giant branch phase isn't affected. And so if the ratio R is like the number of horizontal branch stars divided by the number of red giant branch stars, you'd expect that ratio to decrease if axions were present. And so the great thing about a ratio of numbers of stars is you can just work that out in a kind of model independent way and, and use that to constrain. And so that ended up 
being the best constraint for a long time. And I mean, to be honest, it's, it still is, um, but for this tiny area that I'm working in. Yeah, so uh, slowly moving into uh, the main part of your work, mm -hmm. uh, looking at this parameter space that you mentioned this cosmological triangle, which had uh, a lot of attention lately. Uh, so can you, can you uh, talk about uh, this a little bit and why this is there, there's a region where we fail to exclude with, uh, with uh, stellar cooling constraints uh, and, and if it's possible to relax that, uh, that region or, or, or exclude it with some other assumption, with, for example, in cosmolog different cosmological scenarios. Yeah, absolutely. So um, constraints derived from Big Bang nuclear synthesis do actually uh, rule out that this region. So there's this, just to explain um, in relation to figure one yeah, shown in the paper, excluding my new bounds shown in green, the, the underlying bounds with those present before I started my work. Um, between, between constraints from horizontal branch stars that I just mentioned, and then also that from um, supernova 1970, uh, sorry, 1987A, uh, and also electron beam dumps, there's this small triangular region which is unconstrained. Um, so as I mentioned before, actually cosmological arguments do constrain this region, but they're model dependent. They, they, they can be relaxed in certain viable scenarios um, of non-standard cosmology. Uh, and this received a bit of work a few years ago. And so uh, as a result, it's kind of, it's interesting to say, well, Alps with, uh, with parameters in that region could still be viable because we, we, you know, we can't say for sure that standard cosmology is, the, is correct. Um, and so it's still, it's still worth trying, if we can, to constrain this region. And I mean, beyond that, it's also worth, irrespective of what's going on, these, these constraints come from very different sources. So I, I would say maybe, maybe it's not quite as important, but there is still merit to, to looking at constructing new constraints in different ways. Um, but yeah, the idea is this, this region pretty soon will be... Uh, could be accessed by you know new generations of, of uh, uh, experiments. So, for instance, June. Uh, There's a paper recently which said that June-like experiments should should have access to it, and also uh, Bell two potentially as well. Yeah. So uh, maybe we'll talk about the experiments uh, in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, before doing that, um, what? Uh, so you you trying to uh, it's it's phenomenologically interesting to look at this, uh, at this um, parameter space, um, unconstrained region of the parameter space. Uh, and in the main part of your work, you uh, are using um, a stellar evolution code. So mm. can you talk about a little bit um, about it? Uh, I, I, I think uh, our um, community is less familiar with uh, the stellar evolution part. So what are the challenges and what, what did, did you have to do uh, with these uh, simulation codes? Sure, sure, sure. So I use a, I use a, co a code called uh, Modules for Experiments in Stellar Astrophysics, or MISA. Um, this is developed by, or led, a team led by Bill Paxton. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the main benefits, there's one main reason I use this code, uh, or two maybe. One is that it, it's open source, which is great. I have access to it and it's collaborative. It encourages you, in fact, you have to as part of it, um, uh, if you use it, you, you agree to their manifesto, which says you should do things like put, put your, your version of the code up online after you've released a publication so other people can use it and improve it and um, yeah, look at it for the example. And so the other reason I use this is because there was a, there was a previous paper um, by, um, called oh, a previous paper by Friedland, Alex Friedland, um, Giannotti and Wise which looked at um, how, how um, adding energy loss to axions can um, actually get rid of an entire evolutionary phase in more massive stars, the blue loop. Um, the blue loop is, again, it's a different helium burning phase. It's a helium burning phase for slightly more massive stars than horizontal branch. Um, and it's important because Cepheid variable stars, which are a standard candle in uh, cosmic distance measurements, are they can only occur during this phase. So if, if it doesn't occur at all, then suddenly you don't have an explanation for Cephi variables. So that's a pretty pretty strong reason you could constrain this behavior. So they had met, they had used MISA and had made their code available. And so that was very handy for me because I could go in, I didn't have a lot of coding experience, 
Mises written in Fortran, which I, I had very little familiarity with. So um, it was it was a nice it was a nice base point, and I think that's kind of the purpose of of having it being open source is that you can come and you can use other people's work, crediting them of course, and then get better and get better. And so um, the way the way we the way they and as a result me based on their work included this this new form of energy loss in the code was to go in and change um, change the function in MISA which computes uh, energy loss to thermally produced neutrinos mainly because you know neutrinos are a quintessential example of a light weakly interacting particle when they're produced in a stellar environment they carry energy away they do exactly the same thing phenomenolog uh, phenomenologically and so I could just come in and augment the value computed for this by the amount relevant for Alps and then it would have the desired effect in the code without needing to go in and really make severe changes that I'm not qualified to do. Um, so um, coming back to your uh, final plot where you draw your, your constraint uh, using this, this simulation code, mm. what are the uh, uncertainties that affect uh, your analysis is, is, is it, how can we, um, be sure that it's, it's a robust, uh, limit, especially because sure. it's, it's a seasonal space that would be, would be probed by, by experiments. Yeah, sure. Um, so the question, like, this, this is a really interesting question. And this is the question I get every time I speak to an astrophysicist is, uh, you know, all, all well and good to be doing this stuff, but you know, there are a lot of uncertainties floating about in stellar evolution code. It's very, Sorry, it's, it's a difficult thing to, to use reliably. And with this, I, I agree a lot. And my main approach to this as a result was to try and be conservative at every, every corner. So um, one of the main things that affects, that affects say the initial final mass relation, so yeah, my, my, um, which my constraint is based on is uh, stellar rotation. So MESA is a 1D code. So uh, you, you, know, you, you assume spherical symmetry straight away. Um, and, and so, you know, if, if you're using it kind of in, in its simplest form, there's no stellar rotation. Um, but it turns out stellar rotation has very important effects, which would, you know, counteract the, uh, the, the, the effect of ALPS. So um, what I did in order to do this in the end um, also is a slightly time saving thing because adding, adding in rotation adds another complete degree of freedom for my simulations and you know we know how long sim these simulations take anyway doing an entire sweep of the parameter space is a lengthy process and adding another dimension would really increase the time so what i did was i used some some recent results um uh which uh which studied the effects of rotation on the initial final mass relation specifically and saw that well what it does is um yeah, it, it shifts it shifts the average IFMR up upward, and so in order to kind of um, in order to deal with this, I, I kind of made the, the very blunt decision to demand that well, if 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 the IFMR is shifted upwards by an average of zero point zero eight solar masses by stellar rotation, let's just demand that my results have to beat it by that much as well, and that that's how I, how I've done it. And even making that decision, um, then uh, yeah, even making that decision, we can we can come away with a, with a bound which does uh, which does improve in this area, and that's a pretty that's a pretty strong thing to concede as well, because that's also I should say it's not just rotation which is influencing that influencing that, it's also it's also some uh, another model parameter which is called convective core overshoot. This is getting very starry now, but it's, it's, it's an important one to understand. And it basically references the fact that uh, convective regions in the star have very, very efficient uh, mixing in them. And this is important because if you're, if you're in a region which is well mixed, then you're gonna be increasing the supply of nuclear fuel in that region just because there'll be some floating at the top, but hey, we're well mixed, we can get that down to the bottom and stuff like that. So well mixed extends uh, evolutionary time scales. Um, having uh, convective core overshoot deals with a phenomenon where a parcel of like convective fluid, uh, which arrives at the boundary of the convective region, uh, does so with some non-zero momentum. So instead of just stopping there, they actually can you know penetrate into the non-convective region and increase mixing throughout there. And so it turns out that um, 
the IFMR is quite sensitive to, or ha has a sensitivity to the value you choose for this model parameter. Um, and so, and so the 0 0.08 value that was seen in this uh, is the, acknowledges some kind of increase to the efficiency of core overshoot as well, based that compared with the models that I'm using. Should also say that um, there's a whole lot of free, every time you do a stellar simulation, you have to specify in a file something called your input physics. So this is everything you want that's going into it. It could be where you get it, what the, the values of opacity in the star is, what kind of nuclear reaction rates are you using, all these sort of things, um, how you're treating convection within, within the model. And there are a lot of people out there who really know their stuff about this and, and I don't. And so my decision in this regard was, well, there's a team who have done like published, uh, published uh, stellar evolution simulations based on MESA um, and also developed these, uh, these other tools which astrophysicists regularly use. And my decision to them was to uh, take my input physics from them because they've also, they performed a number of tests which were calibrated to observation as well. And that's the main thing. There's this, there's this level of degeneracy in there where you can, um, where things are calibrated to observation. That's a good thing to do, but it also means that, um, it also means that yeah, it can be quite difficult to really believe ex everything you see coming out of your simulation, particularly when you, you know, we as particle physicists can only know so much about this. Um, and I would, I would actually say, I think there's not yet a really robust way of treating this stuff. So my answer to that was to be conservative. Yeah, so the idea is that even making some conservative decision or let's say assumptions in your analysis, you still uh, manage to improve the limit. And this is, this is, a, this is a, a nice result, uh, I would say. Um, mm, thank you. <laughs> so uh, getting into the experiments part, uh, I don't want to go into the details, Tales, mm. uh, so much of the experiments, um, but I'm I'm just wondering if you can talk about uh, just the time scales of, of those experiments. Are we expecting some results anytime soon? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I probably actually don't know well enough to to give you a good answer on this. I'm afraid. Um, as far as I know, though, I'm not expecting anything that soon. But it is within the next generation of things to come online. Yeah, that's all I can really say. Sorry. Right. No, it's 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 okay. And let's say, as, as, assuming that we uh, we can exclude that, that parameter space based on the experiments. Let's say mm -hmm. we uh, remove the cosmological triangle. What is the future of um, astrophysical constraint on on axon-like particles? Looking now on a more uh, general um, view in the parameter space, not only on uh, MeV, uh, KV uh, axial masses. Sure. I, I think it's going to really big role to play um it's you know it's one of you know our big our big sources of constraints and this stuff this stuff is always improving mainly just because of an inter of this like lovely little interplay between observational and theoretical astrophysics so every time a new telescope goes up every time new results come in there's the potential for these bounds to to increase and there's some really really special things which come out of that for instance, the, um, the constraint that this is based on, the constraint that my work is based on, the constraint on the white dwarf initial final mass relation um, is actually made, well, the original, the original subset is made from, the original case is made from uh, 140 double uh, wide double white dwarf binaries. Um, but uh, actually when you strip it down, there's far, far fewer, you know, about 10 times fewer systems that are, that are used. But there have been um, recently thousands of, the, of new uh, wide binaries found, and if, if there's even at all a reasonable subset of those which are, are wide, into why that's important at a later stage, then um, uh, that's great news because uh, the, the kind of the bounds we're using can be refined, and we can have even better uh, constraints placed. For instance, um, I might we'll get to this at some other stage, I think, but uh, the the constraint I've used is is pretty. It isn't very restrictive at all. Um, and there are reasons why I chose that again, to be conservative. Um, uh, and so, you know, increasing the number of other things available to us, increasing the, the size of the observational um, sample, that'd be great. Uh, and then I think we could, you know, that this new constraint of mine could probably push and be a bit more competitive. Equally, uh, I'm sure horizontal branch constraint will get more and more um, restrictive as well. Uh, 
with, uh, with further observation. And the flip side of this as well is, um, as I mentioned before, there are large theoretical uncertainties in this too. So stellar evolution codes are getting more and more con convenient to use and more and more powerful. I can do my simulations on, I mean, I don't, I use, I use, a, super, I use a supercomputer to do it because it's a lot more, it's a lot easier for me to manage, but I can do them on my own computer. You know, that's a very, it's a very cool thing to be able to just simulate the evolution of the star on your own PC. And so this is, this was not always the case and it's improving a lot and our understanding of this improves too. So these guys are doing fantastic work as well. So that helps. Yeah. So do you think, uh, well, I have one last question for you. Um, do you think you'll be using this improved knowledge of stellar evolution to continue uh, looking at uh, those codes uh, or you think you'll switch your attention on uh, other, uh, other uh, ideas or other parts of the, um, you know, uh, always regarding axon-like particle, I'm assuming. Mm. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I would like to have a diverse interest in this stuff, but you know, I've, I've spent a long time developing the skills required to use this code. You can't, you can't just get in there and, and be a cowboy with it. You know, you have to kind of, you have to know what you're doing at the end of the day. And it'd be silly not to, not to make the most of, of that. And so I'll, I'll definitely re retain a research presence in this field. But I also want to add more strings to my bow. So I'll stay, I'll stay, I'll keep my options open and stay in it. I'm doing some work with it now. Um, and I'm also working at the moment with a, a, an undergraduate student who's doing a, a summer, uh, what was meant to be a summer project, but now a, a research project as a subject. And he's looking at the code as well, basically doing the work with rotation, which I decided to put off lest this project go on too long. But, you know, it, it's nice to investigate and he's got a bit more time to do it. And it's a, it's a nice entry level thing to get a little look at how research works. So I'll keep using it. And uh, I, I think I think it's a good tool for theoretical physicists to have available to them, particle physicists particularly. That's great. Uh, I think uh, we had a good chat. It was very interesting. Thank you very much for, for your time again. Thanks so much, Giovanni. Hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, we'll meet uh, in person. Uh, hopefully mm -hmm. uh, anytime soon we'll be able to uh, have a, an in-person meeting and, and a nice chat. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Thank you.